All right, so here we go. Happy prep day, happy Friday, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us on our live portion call. And for those of you who are gonna watch later, thank you for taking the time out of your day. Of course, we missed you on Friday, but we're thankful that you found a good time to sit down and kind of listen to what we have for you today. We feel blessed to be here. Um, you have two guest speakers today, not just one. You've got two. You've got Robin and Jen. So um, we're excited, right, Robin? I'm pumped. So, hi, everybody. Um, it's really good to see everyone here uh, participating in the group. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about the, the thing that's coming up for the Rooted Cafe, that temple unveiling the temple. Is that what the name of that was? Yeah, the temple it, revealed is revealed. going to be Dr. Dina Dye's course. That's pretty exciting. So I'm, I'm looking forward to diving into that, like teaching my kiddos those lessons. Yeah, so so much good content in there. I mean, there's a lot of things I do. I've started Brenda's Aleph Bet course, did not finish it, need to go back and do that. Love Gail's Parsha points each week. Um, obviously, these recordings are on there, but there's so many other just great things. So the seven day trial, I'm just going to keep pushing again, you've got nothing to lose by going on and giving that a whirl. <laughs> so um, try it out. And if you've got questions, feel free to reach out to me or Sydney or Charlie or um, Misty, we would probably be pretty good people or just post questions on the portion Facebook page and we'll be happy to get back with you. And, um, you know, if you've just got, you know, comments or questions about what it's all about, but it's good stuff and it tracks for you too. That's another thing I really love about the cafe is that I, you know, you're going to forget like where you left off in different courses, but when you go back, you can see your check marks for the things you've done and where you've left off. And then you've got this little marker that goes across the screen that tells you how far through the course you are. So you can kind of track your progress. Um, actually, I want to make another quick announcement too. And that's that please be checking to make sure you're getting Charlie's emails and that they're not going into your spam or maybe you're not getting them at all for some reason. Maybe we know we've got the wrong email or whatever. She sends out on, I think it's Monday. I usually see it on Monday anyway. She'll send out the calls for the week, the, um, the passwords, you know, everything that you need for your calls for the week. But the other thing is she has also been um, really good about sending these little snippets to get you thinking. I've really enjoyed just like, hey, what do you think about this in this week's portion? And, you know, have you ever considered this? And I know what it does is it gives me more things that I can um, study, right? So she'll ask a question and I'm like, I don't know the answer. I'm going to go look that up. And it's not a bombardment of emails. It's all relevant and quick. So please just be checking your emails. I think that's it. I don't have anything else. Okay, so today we've got Vietzi. I'm not sure if I'm even saying it right, but we're going to go with that. <laughs> you know how to say it, Robin? I That's how I, I think it's said. Um, I really need to take that Aleph Bet um, poor, you know, training to learn the Hebrew because I absolutely love it. I know there's so much more depth uh, in the <clears throat> letters that God gave us, right? Yes. As his word. So um, I'm very, very eager for that. I'm looking for that space of time where I can dig in more. Definitely deepens our understanding. So that is important. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, Robin and I just chatted quickly yesterday. And I got to tell you, we were like all over the board with there's a, a million good things to talk about today. But what we want to do is just kind of walk through parts of the portion and just think about life application, because I know that there are so many parts of this portion that resonated with me for literally today. And I feel like the Holy One is so good because I feel like I say that every week, every time I read a portion, I'm like, how is this applicable today for what's going on right now? But he's sovereign and he's good and he gives us this word and he helps to, when we read it, to infiltrate it into our heart and to open up our eyes to different pieces. So maybe what we got is different than you, but we encourage you to please be popping questions and thoughts in the chat. If we miss something that's of interest to you, share. This is a learning opportunity for everyone, including Robin and I. I'm here as a newbie. I think most of you who know me know I've only been walking in Torah for about uh, 18 months. So I'm really new to this. And so I don't have a lot of deep insight for you, but I have a lot of good practical applications. So I'm excited to share. So let's just, can we just start with like Jacob's journey in general, just the yeah. whole process of what's going on? Yeah. So I want to start with this, like, 
maybe just quick two minute overview. And then I want to stop and have like a discussion, Robin, because um, I feel like even the beginning, just thinking about his journey is so powerful that we could spend the whole hour on that, but we don't want to, because I really want to talk about Leah later, but let's just talk about the fact that this is, in my opinion, this was kind of um, uh, his story. So he is living somewhat comfortably in a comfortable place with his parents. Um, his parents are wealthy. Everything is kind of going well. He spent 14 years intense studying Torah, um, you know, trying to understand the laws and, and uh, uh, preparing to spend his life serving the Holy One. And then something happens, a fight with Esau, and he's got to flee. And there's this um, sense that he has got to go. He, his dad gives him uh, this silver and gold to take as a dowry. And his mother says, you're going to leave this place and you're going to go to Haran and you're going to find a wife and you're going to stay there until your brother calms down, until things settle down and it's safe for you to come home. And he leaves and he has all of this um, silver and gold, but we know when he showed up, he showed up empty handed. And uh, the Bible in, it, in and of itself doesn't give us a ton of detail. And I'm going to bring in just a little bit of Jasher today. And here's what I want to say about Jasher. I know not everyone accepts it, and I don't think it's scripture, but I do think it is a good historical document once in a while that we can use to gain a little bit more context. And for this particular story, Jasher did give us a little bit. It tells us um, that when uh, he was on his way to Haran, what happened was Esau sent one of his sons mm -hmm. to meet Jacob on the road. And so his first, you know, he's already afraid. He's leaving this familiar place. He's fleeing for his life. He's going to a land that he knows is wicked. Um, he knows he's going to be going to an uncle who he knows is into divination and worships false gods. And on the road, the first thing that happens to him is uh, he gets somewhat attacked, right? He gets stopped by Esau's son. And I, I wrote his name down, but I cannot remember. I need to find it. Um, but he gets stopped on the road and the silver and gold gets taken from him. And then uh, he's protected, of course, because the Holy One has a sovereign plan. And then he goes and he falls asleep and he has this dream. And he has this dream, and it's speaking of God's protection. I'm going to be with you wherever you go. And he gets up in the morning, and scripture says he's light on his feet and he goes about his way. So I just I just want to stop there. That's again like the 30,000 foot overview, mm -hmm. right? Really high overview. But here's what I want to say about that in particular. When I thought about that, my very first thought was, oh my gosh, that's me today, like literally right now. So I want you all to think about how relevant this can be. We're living in really tumultuous times. There's a lot of things that we may have to walk towards that aren't comfortable or that we know are wicked. Um, just even engaging in the world, I was thinking, you know, we're supposed to be, we're in the world, but we're not supposed to be of the world. And even that alone can be overwhelming. But Jacob, was living with this fear of his brother. He gets attacked, but here's the thing. He stops because it was night. He laid his head down on the rock or rocks. It says rocks. We're going to talk about that. Was rocks then became one rock. Um, and he had this interaction with the Holy one that despite his circumstances, he got up the next morning and he was light on his feet. And he continued on like he was, I think of like, you know, our, 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 our thought of walking on cloud nine, right? Like he got up and despite his circumstances, having an interaction with the Holy One caused his entire mindset to change. And isn't that Robin, what I'm going to let you go. Yeah. Isn't that what he does? Like, I mean, when we're facing these trials, when he reminds us, I am with you, you know, and we have that personal encounter, um, it, it does make us all light on our feet. It changes everything. And it's like, I don't have to focus on the trial. I can just focus on taking one step forward, 
and, and knowing that he's going to catch me. And I think that's where like, okay, so relevance to this world that we're living in today, you know, is all the things that change, right? Like these, these new regulations or whatever, shifting sands, right? And the trouble that we can have with um, today's journey is in the past. So, so I have a business in the past. I could just, I could just run, you know, but today I find myself far more like, is the ground going to meet me there? If I take that step that Mm -hmm. I would have just, I would have just done before. And it's the whole situation where the father's got, got me, I'm in him, he's in me and he has not ever misled me or, you know, I mean, we, we're going to have hardships. We're going to have trials, but the ground will be there to meet me because he has gone before to make yeah. that way. And that's where I, this wilderness that we're in today, as far as like, I don't, I don't know what world we're living in, you know, don't know what's going to be thrown at me next, but I know the one who holds to tomorrow. And I know where I've got the long, the long range, you know, in sight with what he's doing. I just have yeah. to focus on how do I get from here to there. So when Jacob left home, you know, he left with a lack of security. And I just was thinking about how many times in my life I felt this lack of security mm-hmm. where I just didn't feel confident about something, or there was something behind me that was kind of chasing me, right? Something from my past that was haunting or whatever. But the Holy One comes to reassure him of his future and affirm his promises. And he's so good for doing that for us, but he still does that today. Like I hit, I, I read that and it hit me so hard because I thought, you know, even in the most difficult of circumstances, no, no matter what the world brings at us, no matter our past, no matter what's chasing us, his promises still stand. And even in times of uncertainty. So Haran um, means dry land or parched, which of course you always love when the Holy one does this like through his word. Right. So Jacob is going into a land that he knows is parched. So he's heading towards things that aren't going to necessarily give him security or um, confidence. And he's not sure of what he's going to find when he gets there. What he knows is there's wickedness in that land, but yet he has to go to it. He's, he needs to go there. He has, he's got to continue to live his life. He's got to continue to do the things he needs to do. He needs to go there and establish himself and find a wife and find a place to be safe. And technically it's family. So it feels like it should be safe, but that's, that's just a, I don't know. I guess I, when I think of it in today's world, a lot of things don't feel secure right now. There's a lot of things that happen and it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, if you read the Facebook posts, um, there, are, and, and I, I want to talk about this more when we get to Leah, but I just feel it pressing really hard on my heart. There's something really powerful about how what's happening in the world. Like we know the enemies out there and he is strongly attacking families. We see it with marriages right now. I mean, ladies, you've been expressing, and I'm so grateful for every one of you who shares her story because this will make me really whew, have to make sure I don't start crying on this one. But, you know, it's encouraging for me to know that there's, you know, we have each other because this world is uncertain in all things and Satan is out to destroy families. But even if we're moving towards a parched land, even if we're going into a dry place, we have the assurance that our father wants to meet with us and that he loves us and that his promises are still true. So regardless of what this immediate circumstance is, like for Jacob, his brother wanting to take him out, you know, and this fear of him losing his life, you know, that is those are things that we deal with today. Like things are trying to be stripped from us. People want us to be, well, the enemy wants us to, you know, he wants to come and steal, kill and destroy. And we see all of these things happening in families and worries about kids not walking, you know, with the Holy one. And they're, you know, they're turning to idols. They're, you know, they're, they're not walking a path of righteousness. And we have all of these concerns, but the reality is, well, first off, the Holy one knows (laughs) But secondly, he wants to meet with us. Robin, let's let's talk about um, what you had sent me this morning and about, you know, putting the Holy One first. 
Yeah, so I, I, c- I continued, you know, to, to dig into this and found, um, I think, one of the Midrash teachings where, you know, they talk about the, the rabbi who was giving this message talked about, you know, we've got this picture of um, Jacob and uh, Leah and, and Rachel, right? You got this little love triangle thing going here, only it's not a lot of love between the two sisters, but at least it doesn't feel like it. And it shows that like, if, if the father isn't first, you know, he's got to be first place. And I think, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to work this through just a little bit because I thought about it since, you know, sending that to you, Jen. And I'm going to speak from my perspective, which being raised in, you know, basically just regular America, mainstream Christianity, realizing how Gentile my mindset is. Um, and, and Gentile concepts are completely foreign to Hebraic thought. Yes. And so when I read the story of Jacob and Leah and Rachel, the words that come off the page at me that Jacob, you know, he, he, I hear in his voice, his tone to Laban that he's displeased with Leah, you know, and that he's really going, how can I, I, in my, in my own internalizations, I'm thinking he wants to shun this. This isn't really what he wants. It's rejection. But this, this midrash teaching this Torah portion from another rabbi who has a Hebraic, (laughs) a very Hebraic understanding of the scriptures, right? He's going, the only one who knows that, who knew those thoughts were the father. Were Hashim. Yes. It wasn't, um, you know, so even though he was saying, he's asking Laban, why did you trick me? But he's not saying it in such a way that it is um, scorning Leah. And so I am hearing this differently because it ties in with the, the New Testament teachings on, you know, a husband is to love his wife just as Christ loved the church. And this rabbi is tying that into even this portion right here, which is where the beginning of that is. And so that, um, that Jacob was going to love Leah, right? Leah, I want to leave the, 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 you know, beauty of her eyes, how um, tender they were to you, Jen, but like just how much the father wants to be first place, that our love for him, he can't be second. He can't be the unloved. And if we have something that we love more than him, then he kind of takes on that role of the, the unloved one. Um, you know, the, the lesser, Yes, he can't, he can't have that position. Um, and though, so Jacob had spent the time in the tents, right? This wilderness, all, and that's us. Like we've been trained. We've been, you know, we've maybe we've been raised in, in homes that thankfully because of the ease of which we have the word or we've been given this, um, we've got these little roots, right? But as we go throughout, like those roots have to go down and go deeper. We have to understand a greater context of how much the father loves us and the father's love is, is the teaching, you know, it's the expression in all of our relationships and we've got to, we've got to, unfortunately, we've got to work that out right here in this present day. And it's hard yeah. because other humans are involved, yeah. but I just loved how it wasn't the expression that I had always heard of scorning Leah or being, um, rejecting resentful, you know, those, those, those pictures or those connotations started to like disappear from my mind as I realized, you know, this was, this is the plan the father had. And, um, and Jacob may have favored Rachel, right? It's who he was after, but he was still going to love and honor um, Leah as his wife. And there are, there are rules, laws around protecting that because Jacob, Leah and Rachel aren't the only ones in scripture that have, you know, a husband with two wives. Right, right. So we're kind of, we kind of jumped ahead a little bit, which is great. Um, A a, a couple thoughts, you know, I I was thinking about um, when, when Robin had sent me that Midrash teaching, and I was kind of just looking through it real quick before we hopped on, I started thinking either you're for him or you're against him. And I don't know why that just kept popping in my mind, because when we, you know, we see that he loved and he hated our English Western minds with hated 
you know, we think something completely different than what that means. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's a lesser love. It's, it's just not putting as a priority or putting first. So, um, I, you know, and I know people have struggled with that. Like in, in, in Christian circles, I've heard that forever. Like, well, how could he hate, you know, and we would, we would try to make the scriptures fit our Western mindset to understand what it could mean that he hated. And I remember even myself thinking, and, and this is what I love. So Jacob was on a journey of spiritual maturity. And I'm going to say this, then I'm going to finish my thought with that word. Um, but he had spent all this time dwelling in tents, but when did he really have an opportunity to really utilize it in a discipleship type fashion or to really like live it out? And so I take this whole journey from Jacob from the time he left home to being in Haran and getting married and, you know, building his flock and then eventually leaving 20 some years later he had an opportunity to live out all the things he was taught. And I do think that that's relevant for our wilderness journey. Like what's the reason why the Holy one puts us through the things that we go through. Right. You know, I was just sick for two weeks and I got to tell you, it was really rough and I've never been sick that long. And the whole time through, I just kept asking the whole why, and, um, and I felt so disconnected and so alone. And like, he just wasn't with me. Like he had just kind of left me to rot, <laughs> but he, he didn't. And when I came through it and he and I started having more dialogue through the word, and I started really contemplating a lot of that situation, I started really seeing a lot of the blessings, but we all have to go through this journey of spiritual maturity. And unfortunately, it's not always comfortable. We can't always stay in the safe place. We're going to be put in positions, um, you know, in Haran, you know, um, saying that the meaning is like parched. It's, it's spiritually dry. And, and we live in a world where there's a lot of spiritual dryness. We still have to exist in the world and we need to be a light and we need to gain some spiritual maturity as we interact with people who maybe don't walk the way we do or believe what we do. And even sometimes we want to, we want to push our agendas or push our motives in a way that maybe isn't necessarily light bringing because it feels more condemning. Um, I wasn't planning on saying that, but I felt really strongly about saying it. So we'll just put that out there. Um, and I know that I've done that too, but anyway, I'm getting way off track. So um, actually, I kind of lost my train of thought. I was going to go somewhere with Jacob, but, but anyway, the I think those, the dryness of the wilderness, right? Yeah, it was, it was, yeah. The dryness of the wilderness can, can be um, overwhelming for us. Yeah. Well, it can be dry, non-life-giving, right? Like non-life-giving, no fruit. Yeah. Um, which means that, I mean, you know, it's just, it's barren. <clears throat> um, it's empty. And yet when, when the rook fills us, right, it says that we'll be filled with like streams of living water. And so he, just like in the, um, in the wilderness in Sinai, it was the rock, right. That, that was the water, the source, mm -hmm. um, that watered them. And the rock is still applicable for us even if it's not something that we see physically, it's now something that is, is physically inside of us, right? He dwells yeah. there and, and refreshes us, but we do have to, you know, go out and walk this, walk in this wilderness, right? It's the time of, of uh, testing. I talked to you yesterday about, I was reminded of Matthew four, mm -hmm. you know, and, and Yeshua is, it says that the spirit led him up to the wilderness and it was the very, it was the father, the spirit as well, that, that got them out of Egypt and led them into the wilderness there as well. And so I, and Jacob, right? Like he's got this cush little life. Can you just imagine he's the favorite child, yep. you know, um, everything is, I mean, he just, I've got, I've got children in my family and it's not that one of them is loved more than the other, but you know, there's, there's the little ones that like, somehow or another, you can just see that gleam in their eye where they're like, they just want to do, they, they're, I don't, maybe they're people pleasers. Okay. Shh, don't, don't be offended by that because those little children are so eager to just, they want to, they want to do whatever mom or dad or grandma or grandpa like says, and they just love the fact that like, 
you know, they can just see that it pleases that, that family member. And so Jacob's been in this place where he's like, look at me, I'm the favorite, <laughs> you know, like I can do no wrong. And then guess what? A rude awakening happens and every single person has this. You've got to go put what you believe into practice. Mm -hmm. You, it's got to be tested. It's, it needs to bear fruit inside of you in places where there is no fruit. And you've got to decide who are you going to reflect? What are you going to continue? What, what is true about what's inside of you? Is it Elohim or, or is it what the, the wild beasts in the wilderness, right? Which, which right. nature comes through? <clears throat> Think of it as like spiritual sanctification. And, you know, I, one of the reasons I think that Jacob had to leave home and go on this journey, which really challenged him a lot, was because this was where he was going to grow. Mm -hmm. And just like I kind of mentioned, you know, when I was sick and, you know, I was kind of struggling. And then when I felt better, I was kind of, kind of able at that point then to see some of the blessings that came out of that situation. We don't always see it when we're in it, but sometimes we can see it later. But though, if you ever think back to any wilderness period you've ever had, right? Mm -hmm. You think back to any wilderness period, was it not a time of growth and maturity for you? Absolutely. And so if we were to wish that he would just remove all of those things, like take the thorn out of my side, why, you know, why is this thorn here? It's there for your benefit and for his glory. Ooh, and, um, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, right? So yeah. if we, if we never experience those things, how are we ever really tested to know that we carry, uh, the love of the Holy one in our heart and that we right. are going to live for him, no matter the circumstances mm -hmm. and the dryness. I mean, this word just keeps popping in my head, you know, this whole dryness, um, when the land is parched and it's, it feels really dry, it can be a depressing place to be. And how do we let that affect us? Like when we're in the middle of dryness, whether it's us personally, like we're going through a dry patch where we don't hear his voice, we have a hard time focusing, studying. And I know that there was just a, a conversation, um, in the portion, again, I really do love reading all of the posts and I'm, I'm so incredibly grateful for all the women who just share because people are vulnerable and they're transparent. And the, one of the best things about this group in particular, because I'm sure all of you are part of many different groups, this group is just not judgy. We love each other and we try so hard to help and to nourish each other and uplift each other. But, um, you know, there was one lady one day just said, um, in her post, she's like, I can't read. I can't focus. It's like her eyes were off the Holy one. She wasn't interested. There was just some, you know, barrier that was causing her to not be able to, um, invest the time and feel connected. And that's our dryness, mm -hmm. but sometimes, and I think, um, you know, when Jacob had to leave and he had to go to Haran, another benefit of that was for him to be a light in a dark place. Yeah. So, um, and I'm saying this because I don't, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be careful with my words because I have some strong opinions and I don't necessarily want to inflict my opinions, but if we decide and a friend of mine, my friend Rhonda and I have been talking about this a lot lately. If we decide that the world is just too much and we are going to close ourselves off from it and stay in our safe place that doesn't give us the opportunity to truly be a light to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's uncomfortable to go into those dry places where we kind of feel like I don't fit here. I don't belong here. These people don't care. They're doing their own thing. They're walking their own path and I'm uncomfortable and I don't want to be surrounded. I'm even afraid it might influence me. Like what if their negativity and the worshiping of false God starts to rub off or whatever. But I think it's also an opportunity that spiritual maturity is a time for us to trust that he's going to use us in a way that we don't even understand. We might not even know it. Like we could be impacting somebody and not even know it because we opted to go to that dry place out of obedience because that's what Jacob was doing. Mm -hmm. He was fulfilling prophecy, but he was going to this dry place out of obedience and 
he knew it wasn't going to be comfortable, but he did it anyway. But how blessed was he because he went? Absolutely. But can you imagine, again, just kind of, just to, just to speak to the fact that the, the way that we leave to go into the wilderness, he was prepared. He, he was, he was sent with the wealth in order to obtain the prize, right? So his mind is, I'm going, because we can do this. I know I sure can. I'm going, I have a, a mission. I'm going to get there. I'm going to accomplish it. And I'm going to come right back. And he goes, and he's attacked, and he loses all of his, his material. His dowry. Wealth. He loses the dowry. Show that has to show up empty. Mm-hmm. And now has to go, well, I really, really want this Rachel chick, <laughs> you know? And, and so what am I going to do? Well, I guess I'm going to work for her because I have nothing else to offer. And, and so it doesn't always, it just doesn't always look like we thought, but it's for his good, our good and his glory. Like you said, the yeah. thorn that's uncomfortable, right? The, the, whatever the, the race that we have to individually run, um, and we're going to trip and we're going to stumble and it's not going to be perfect. The, the beautiful thing about this community is having those who will lift you up and elevate you and speak yes. the life back into you when it's just been too dry and it's just evaporated any water you had, right? And that way the spirit can speak and re- replenish and, and that way you can get back up, right? And keep going on your journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about what happens when he arrives, because there's just a whole bunch of stuff that happens when Jacob actually arrives. And, um, you know, there's a I'll do a little 30, 30,000 30, foot overview again, and then we can dig into some topics. But, um, you know, some of the things that really struck me, which I just thought were very fun, um, was to consider that, you know, when he arrived, he was just tearful and joyful that he had made it. He sees Leah, um, he gives her this kiss, he, you know, she's going to water the sheep and the guys were all like, oh, it's going to take a lot of men. And he just goes over and he just pushes the rock, supernatural strength, you know, to kind of, um, I don't know if it was to impress her or what it was. I just thought that part of the story was super cute because he was flexing his muscles for the woman that he looked at and he instantly felt passionate about, obviously, Um, and then there's obviously some situations where, you know, he meets with Laban and, you know, Laban, when you kind of read through this, I just kind of heard the wickedness in everything he said. It reminded me personally of like Satan in the garden and in one place in particular, um, when Jacob makes the proposition initially, and he says, um, you know, because if he would have showed up with a dowry, chances are he would have just, you know, paid the dowry and, you know, stayed whatever time and been able to take Rachel and not had to work off, um, you know, his, his dowry, or he wouldn't have had to pay his dowry in the seven years of work. But in Laban's word, when Jacob makes this, uh, request of, you know, he's trying to make a deal. Okay. How about this contract? You know, I work for you in an exchange, you give me Rachel. If you notice Laban's words, it reminds me of, um, the serpent in the garden of how he kind of twists the answer where he doesn't actually say yes. He says, and Laban said, it it is better that I give her to you than I should give her to another man. Stay with me. Mm-hmm. So he never really agreed to the terms. And it, I kind of read that and I'm like, you sly little stinker, you like you. So we know that Laban probably knew from the beginning, his plan was not to do that because then after the seven years, we see that, you know, there's a little trickery going on with Leah, which I want to talk about, but then he's agreed like, okay, if you stay seven more years at the end of the wedding week, I'll give you Rachel. How's that? Is that fair? Um, and so this whole thing is kind of interesting. Now, some of you may not agree with this and that's okay. Um, but one of the things I wrote down that just kind of struck me was that, um, well, I wrote down, um, by measure, you will be measured. Um, Jacob took advantage of Esau and now Laban's taken advantage of Jacob. And I guess how I, how I, um, kind of put this in my head, how I analyzed it and broke it down is, Sometimes the things we do to other, I think the Holy One puts us through so that we can build empathy and compassion for people. And um, 
that was one of the lessons I took away from that is some of the things that Jacob did back home, he's now having done to him out here in this foreign land as kind of a sojourner. And um, I thought of as kind of, um, you know, there was a level of justice in that, or it was a teaching opportunity for the Holy One to kind of walk through that. I don't know if anyone else picked up on that, but I, I just thought that was interesting that there was you know, a little bit of that going on. Robin, what do you think? It, you know, I'm also wondering, and I think we talked about this yesterday, like in, in that, right, the balancing of the scales, but these communities, I don't know how far apart they were exactly. I'm sure there is maps and things that would tell me, but there's still the, there's still the, the back and forth communication, right? Like Laban knows his, his, um, his sister has a son, right? And so, and then he probably knows about Esau and Jacob and these communities, even regardless of Laban and his, um, you know, whether he, he didn't accept Elohim, right? He, he had a lot of idols that yes. he worshiped, many gods. And I wonder too, because of the spirit of competition, natural to, you know, that's human nature and um, kind of always the, well, and I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but like when you're, when you have it in your heart, to be obedient to what the father says, the world <laughs> will sometimes also have a, a balancing scales to test you, whether that's in person or in nature to go, mm -hmm. do you mean it? And so I'm just wondering yeah. if, if Laban was like, <clears throat> you're the younger, you have broken tradition. And now I'm going to get to elevate myself over you because we don't do that here. You're wow. My oldest. That's yeah. I mean, I can and see I mean, how that you, plays out in the that? world. Do you hear that in his thing? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Not not in my house because, you know, because it's that re it's really that testing of, you know, whose god is greater? My idols while I honor my traditions and make sure my firstborn has what she's supposed to have or your god who's allowed you to usurp the the firstborn and your parents also you know did it so i'm just seeing that from laven's viewpoint of that spirit of competition and i'm better than you and we're not gonna we don't do that because he he says specifically we're not doing that here you know it must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn no 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 you know and so he's holding jacob to the standard that jacob knows even though God told Rebecca, this is how it's going to be. Right. Well, you know, that's interesting that you say that because I agree on most points, but I, I, I question some of it because I think that, um, and, and some of you who have been walking in this journey, correct me if I'm wrong here, but there was um, mm -hmm. a requirement that the firstborn, it was very typical. So the way it should have went was, Esau would have married Leah right. and Jacob would have married path. Rachel, but because Esau was out with these Hittite women and doing his thing mm -hmm. and Leah wasn't married yet, he didn't feel like he could marry off Rachel until Leah was married. Um, yeah. And so there was this uh, um, understanding, but I don't, I think it was probably more than just in that country. My understanding is that that was sort of the way they did things in that whole culture. And right. I, I don't know if Sombra knows this or not, but I think I read it was like 500 kilometers between the two. So yeah. if anybody knows that, so it would have been a distance. But, and I always wonder like, how did they communicate back then? Like we've got Facebook and texting and all of that, but how do you pass that message when you're, when you've got that amount of distance, how does that happen? Are people constantly traveling back and forth and carrying messages or how did that work? But anyway, I think it was, yeah. I think it was a while, but let's, let's kind of transition and start talking about Leah and the, and the weddings and how all and Jackie, of that went. Jackie brings that up. Jackie says, you know, the reference may be that Esau should have married Leah. And then mm -hmm. um, Erica says that Leah was supposed to marry Esau, but that she had weak eyes because of crying over that, which is what the midrash that you had um, really dug into was the reason why Leah's eyes were weak. Yes. And that's, that's kind of, so that's the transition <clears throat> of, you know, this, what should have been right but i do i do think that laban is is kind of going we're going to keep to tradition you know well it's true like, yes 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 we're going to yes. keep that and um we're not you know 
I'm not going to, you know, change my traditions because you've showed up without a dowry and want to marry my younger. Yeah. You know? Um, so let's kind of just talk about that because I think the next thing is we kind of weave, you know, Jacob's journey and everything he was dealing with from the dream and having that interaction with the Holy one to, you know, continuing into that dry land where he knew it was going to be, um, you know, he was going to be challenged and things were going to happen. We also, I, I kind of think of this, I'm trying to describe how to explain it. Like think of simultaneously as Jacob is preparing to come to Haran to take a wife at the same time. I envision it at the same time. Maybe it's not exactly the same time. Leah, and I learned a little bit of this in Jasher as well. Um, our, our, our Bible doesn't tell us all of this, but that we know that her eyes were weak and there's different midrashes that talk about what it means for the eyes to be weak. But one of the things that kind of mentions in Jasher is that her eyes were, were tired from all of the crying and praying she did to Elohim, to the Holy One, because she knew the custom mm -hmm. was that she was going to have to marry Esau. Right. And she didn't want to marry him because he was wicked. And so I think in our in our current day, the Holy One does that for us. Like we, you could have people intersecting from five different areas and he's working on all of their circumstances simultaneously until it comes together in the, together in this beautiful picture where you can only give him credit because mm. there's no way you yeah. could have orchestrated the beauty of all of these events coming together. But if she was in the meantime, crying, knowing, you know, my sister's prettier, nobody wants to marry me. My father wants to get rid of me. This is the epitome of rejection. And Robin had mentioned that earlier that she, she doesn't have self-confidence. She doesn't feel strong and beautiful and loved and valued, but kind of like Robin was talking about with what she had sent me today, that we have to put the Holy one first. Like he has to be that love versus either you're for me or against me, that love and hate. Leah cried out to him and prayed that something would happen where she wouldn't have to marry the wicked man Esau and the Holy One was preparing that in advance because he, he knew what Laban was going to do. He knows the beginning from the end. And so I look at that and I think even in our lives today, no matter what our situation is, he is going before us and he is preparing and making a way for the future that we feel like is impossible. Mm -hmm. He's doing that right now on your behalf because he loves you that much that even though you don't see a solution or a way out of your current circumstance, he is already doing it. You don't know it because you don't see it. Leah didn't know it. She sat there crying and weeping. Her eyes were weak. She had no idea that he was preparing that, but he absolutely, because she was a righteous woman, was going to give her to a righteous man. Yes. Even, yeah. even though culture said, no, that's not the plan. You know, you're going to have to marry the firstborn and it's just the way it's going to be. And if he's wicked and married to these, you know, Hittite women and worshiping all these false gods, that's just your destiny. And this is something else that I thought about, um, her prayers, you know, we have the verse, um, the prayers of the righteous avail much. Mm -hmm. And this to me is an example of that because do we limit Mm -hmm. what we pray for, because we feel like some things are just, and I'm going to air quote, destined to happen to us. I was convicted by this, which is part of the reason I wanted to talk about it this week, because I started realizing that I sometimes limit what I pray for, mm -hmm. but he says, come to me and ask me anything. So even if we feel like this whatever's out here in front of us is certain, right? Like, well, that's just going to be the way it's going to be. It's never going to change. Nothing's ever going to change it. We can't do that. We can't limit where we put the Holy One in terms of his ability to be sovereign. We have to pray for everything that he places on our heart and everything that pains us. And if it's not within his will, then he'll show us that and he'll, he'll help direct our prayers. But in the beginning, when Jacob had his dream and the Holy One appeared to him and it, and he was shocked, like this, the scripture is like, basically like, I didn't think I'd see you here. 
That's what they did to the gods back then. They were limited by space. Right. They could only work in this section of space. And so part of this lesson for me is realizing and remembering and praising the Holy One that he's not limited by anything. And so I just want to encourage you to pray yeah. about all things and all circumstances, even the ones that seem impossible, because he is the God who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. Right. And, and so and let's Leah not be like, sorry, sorry, Jen. Okay. Leah was absolutely praying the will of the father, right? Like right. she did not want to go along with what her life would look like if she married, you know, this, this man who um, only satisfied his, his beast flesh desires, you know, she didn't want that. And so that's, that's really kind of the whole, the, probably the dividing line, right? Like, mm -hmm. what are our prayers? Are we praying, you know, for someone to um, have their eyes opened, right? To, to see truth, to, to get, to get more insight or to even come to saving knowledge of who Yeshua is. Yes. You know, are we, are we praying those that the will, are we praying that we reflect who he is in spirit and truth in our living? Um, because those are the prayers that definitely change you know, the trajectory of, of heaven. I think he, he want he longs to quicken those. Mm -hmm. Although the journey may, the journey may be longer because I know family members who have been walking out, you know, praying faithfully for 40, 50 years, you know, and not necessarily seeing the fruit of, mm -hmm. of that desired outcome, but being faithful to it anyway. And, uh, and Leah, that was, that was her heart. She did not want to be connected with someone who was going to, you know, take her lineage off, off toward more idolatry. Right. I wrote down one of the midrashes I read. Um, <clears throat> one of the sages said, uh, Leah's prayer was so powerful that it annulled her predetermined destiny. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay. Yes. I have to never limit how I pray, especially I do agree. You know, you said she was praying the will, but I think sometimes we have these deep feelings and we feel like it might go against the will and we don't pray, but how right. do we know? Right. Yeah. So right. we have to be faithful in praying. That's so, exactly. you know, um, this whole idea of rejection, I think that's pretty common in our society today too, that even if you look at just you know, social media or television or what the world says is beautiful, strong, powerful. I mean, any of that stuff. Um, we have built a culture, our Western culture, of being really good at making people feel rejected. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I was thinking about this week as I was studying this was, um, Leah felt rejected by her dad, by the world, unwanted, et cetera. But we are so loved and we see so many examples in scripture where the Holy One really stood up for women specifically. And um, it, it just, it really struck me that I just feel like I want to, and I don't really have the words right now, so maybe I'll come back to it, but that we want to be reminded that we are loved and cared for and that what the world says, it doesn't really matter because everything in the world is passing away. So if we keep our eyes focused on the author and perfecter of our faith, if we keep our eyes focused in and on the word of God, where the truth lies, we will be much stronger able to turn our eyes away from what the wickedness of the world says about us and to us about our physical self or even what we're, what we're doing now in this journey. I mean, I, I know for a lot of you, <clears throat> I'm experiencing rejection right now from family members. And my eldest daughter, Maddie, um, she's 25 and she lives in Chicago. So she's about five hours away from me. I, could, I knew that our relationship was really strained right now. I could just feel it. I could just feel that she wasn't into talking to me. She was actually in my hometown for a couple of weeks and didn't even call me to tell me. And that's our relationship used to be really tight. And so I called her a couple of nights ago and I just said, you know, what's, what's going on. And, um, 
I was trying to get to the bottom of it. And I'm glad that she was honest, but she said, well, you've just changed and I just don't feel any connection to you anymore. I don't feel like we have anything in common. Um, you're, you know, you can be pushy, like, and, and of course I was trying to defend it. And then the Holy one just said, stop, just stop because she's, she's, she doesn't understand and you just need to love her right now. Like what she needs, you're her mom. She needs to love you, but we feel rejection by the world because I don't support some of the things that she does in her, in her daily walk. And I don't support some of the things she does, but you know, part of it was Christmas, which, you know, when you're in this journey and I know some of you still celebrate Christmas and you need to do what the Holy one leads you to do. I'm not going to say it's right or wrong. We all need to walk according to our own journey, but ended up coming up that, She's like, you're just, you know, you've taken it too far. You've gone all, all, you know, over the edge and now you're going to ruin the holidays. And she'd never said that to me before. And I was a little bit surprised and I kind of didn't respond, but I'm like, it's even coming from my own family members, you know, so we can feel um, rejected and despised by the world sometimes, but it just doesn't matter. I mean, we need to continue to be a light and walk according to the way he's leading us because we're called to be righteous. We're called to be a light in a dark world. And we know that in the end, the endurance of the saints are going to be the ones who prevail. We have to keep going no matter how hard it is, but that's not easy. And we all know that that is that we feel like, and that's why I said in the beginning, when we feel the enemy just attacking our families right now, our children and our husbands and everything, and it can cause us, I think, sometimes to shy away or to want to conform to the patterns of the world or to give in or to, you know, barter something. And uh, I just, I guess I would just caution us on some of that. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, this is, this is where when Yeshua ate with, you know, it says he ate with sinners, right? Like, mm -hmm. and, and that's how, that's kind of how that Gentile mindset goes. He conformed, right? He, he brought something new and he changed everything so that the Gentile could basically, I don't, this makes no, it never really has made sense to me. The Gentile could continue to do exactly as they had done before. I, I don't know, but, but Shabbat and all of the feasts, right? The, the thing about it is, because especially um, if we have, if we've been raised in, um, you know, again, mainstream Christianity with mainstream, um, you know, holidays, then, then our families could feel rejected and, mm -hmm. you know, forlorn at this time. And the thing about it is, is we, if we want to be that light, we need to bring them into his feast times and show that to them, right? So Shabbat. Shabbat is for fellowship. It's for family meal times, and I'm just I'm very I'm making confession. My my conviction is invite them to come on the journey with you. Make them a part of the journey. Make them a part of Shabbat. That's a weekly thing. Make them a part of you know um, Passover Seder, right? Bring them into the story the same as the Father has brought me into His story. Bring them in because sometimes the the rejection that they feel is um, one of, you know, condemnation and, and, uh, you know, I'm not good enough. Um, I don't get this. Um, you know, the father doesn't love me. I'm not worthy. He's not telling me these things. Why is he not telling me these things, you know? And instead of, again, that spirit, instead of ha maybe leaning in the, the vein of the spirit of competition, which I know isn't the intentions, but again, it's sometimes how people receive it. Like, you're better than me, right? Jacob and Esau, you know, his, he, he was the, he was the son that was like, I'll do whatever you want. Let's, let's sit in the tent all day and just, you know, take in what we're supposed to do. And, you know, Esau's like, no, I want to go hunt. <laughs> and so, um, in, in making that invitation, right. Come and do come and take part of it. You know, Yeshua, what he really did when it says he ate with sinners, when he's telling Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today, it's Shabbat. And Zacchaeus is like, I'm not prepared to do Shabbat with you. <laughs> and Jesus is going, sure you are. I'm going to show you how. And that's the spirit that we need to, to invite those that we love in, right? And you know, of, well, this is my thing. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, I'm going to honor the father by doing Shabbat myself, even that nobody else wants. How do we know nobody else wants to do it with us? 
You know, why, why do we do Christmas? Why do we do Easter lunch? Why do we do the things we do? Because the family just said, hey, we're getting together and we're going to eat. We're getting together and we're going to eat. You know, I really appreciate you saying that because I just, I just felt a real ping in my heart that, um, you know, we, cause, and I'm, I'm confessing this to you sisters, cause this is a confession right now. I never thought of the fact that they feel rejected, that what they do now is not good enough. Like I have never in this whole 18 months, I've never really stopped to consider that maybe some of the resistance I'm getting is because they feel rejected. I'm so worried about me feeling rejected, right? Like that's my focus. Like they're rejecting me and they don't, you know, they don't want to talk to me and they think I'm crazy and they don't see my level of happiness. And honestly, here's my confession. Me, 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 me. It's all about me. I mean, even with my daughter, I'm like, I don't understand why she's been mad at me. Our relationship is strained and she doesn't feel like she can talk to me. I'm just as lovable as I was before (laughs) without feeling like maybe one of the things I've really done is I've alienated her because she feels rejected on the other side. Oh, that's, that's going to be my takeaway today. So how do we, I mean, I understand what you're saying about, you know, inviting them into our journey. Um, and let's assume, okay, because we, I want to kind of, I don't want to go off the Torah portion teaching, but let's just talk about like, okay, so Jacob goes and he's um, in Haran and he's dealing with Laban, who is a bit of a deceiver. And, you know, is again, to me, he's kind of like the serpent. He just kind of changes his words a little bit so that the meaning is all skewed. But how do we adequately, even outside of family, how do we reflect? Let me think of how I want to ask this. How, how do we invite people into that in a less, in the, I don't want to say lesser way. I got to think about my question. It's not coming out right. How I guess I'm just thinking if, if they feel rejected mm-hmm. and we're trying to teach them our agenda, not, I shouldn't even say agenda. I like to post on my personal page um, things about Shabbat and why it's important. And here are verses, because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get them to see the perspective and understand the scriptures. They could be on the other side, feeling more rejected. So as we continue to live in this world and we're thinking about discipleship and we're in a dry land, how do we do that in a way that doesn't alienate or reject others without um, modifying the truth. I think it's, I think it's, it's that whole thing. I saw somebody else use it and I was like, oops. Um, and I think it might've been in the portion, but you know, rules without relationships breeds rebellion. Say that again. Wait, say that again. Rules without relationship breeds rebellion. So we have to change that to being relational, right? So for, for tonight, I've, I've invited, you know, my mom, come do um, a Rev Shabbat with us. If you're not busy, come eat the meal, you know, because it starts tonight at sundown. Is it, is, is it going to be anything um, magical? Not really. I mean, it's, it, it really isn't. I, t- sorry, if, if, it, if it's a magical thing for anybody, I'm not trying to burst anybody's bubble. It's not magical. The magic is in the conversation that happens at the table. It's food that we've blessed, that we eat. It's a remembering, it's an act of what we are doing in fellowship with the father, right? That's the magic. It's not my house, it's not the table, it's those that are around it. And he wants us at his table. Yes, hallelujah. So we want to bring them in because um, I saw another sister who was like, you know, I, I, this is not on the Torah portion, so I'm sorry, folks, but you know, the, the Halloween had just t- transpired and some um, had been on doing basically Sukkot right the week before Halloween. So they get back from Sukkot um, and the camping and the wonderfulness of fellowship. And they're like, I had no, I, it, it was, it, it wasn't, it didn't occur to me that I was going to have people ringing on my doorbell, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and that was kind of the thing is 
God gave us these beautiful times to get together with him so many times, you know, like I remember being raised with, he didn't, he doesn't really, he doesn't really tell us how he, it is that we're supposed to celebrate now this side of the resurrection. So we, we've just kind of invented Christmas and, and these other things. Literally, this is what I was told. Um, and I, and now going, he didn't leave a void that we needed to manufacture. He gave us weekly celebrations. He gave us seven additional times plus two more Hanukkah and Purim, which specifically were, were celebrated because why? Because the people had lived almost annihilated by an antichrist spirit. If I can't get a hallelujah right there and go, yes, I can recognize that. Do we have any greater need to fellowship today? Right. And proclaim we're still here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so my family who is hearing words of, I'm not going to be at the Christmas stuff because I have no taste for it because what he has given me is far more beautiful than, than, than my efforts of commercialism. Cause that's really all it was. So uh, Lin Linda Millett speaking to my heart. I want to share her comment. This was okay. Linda. Thank you for this. This is just, it's beautiful and it's perfect. She said, when we walk in obedience to the Holy One and truly follow Torah and keep Shabbat and the Moedim, as we bless our loved ones in prayer on Erev Shabbat and the Holy One moves upon our, the Holy One moves upon our loved ones' hearts, mm -hmm. he draws them. We don't have to drag them Woo! in. I'm going to hallelujah that one. Woo! Me too. Amen. You know, and, and you're right. It, it does actually come in quite a bit through prayer. Um, I think we, 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 I'm saying me, but I'm hoping maybe there's one other person that will concur on this, that especially if you're kind of a controlling personality or a powerful personality, you always feel like you have to do something right. We do do stuff out of obedience, but only to the Holy one. Like we don't, we can't save anyone. We can't do anything to cause someone's heart to change. Only the Holy one can do that. And most of you that know me, which is probably pretty much everybody, at least on the Zoom, is that my husband's not even a believer. And that's, that's a whole long story. We got married before the Holy One kind of called me into this. But, um, but, you know, that's kind of a struggle. But for years, the first four years of our marriage, I felt like it was my responsibility to shame him into belief. And one night I was so distraught. I woke up in the middle of the night. I was out in the living room and I was praying. And it was that still small voice saying, you don't get to save anyone. That's my glory, right? Like, why don't you just let me do the work in his heart? Let me be the one to impact him and influence him. You just keep living a righteous life. You just keep obeying my word. This was before I was in Torah. Um, you know, but that was really powerful for me thinking through how much of it is my responsibility versus how much is the Holy ones. Cause let's be real. We don't want the responsibility to have to save people. No, right. Like we don't want that responsibility, even in the driest of lands, we do not want to be the ones who feel like it's up to us to save our family members. Yet. I think we all feel the pressure of the world and everything that the world says is good. And we know that the word says, you know, in the last days, things are going to be twisted. Good is going to seem evil and evil is going to seem good. Mm -hmm. And in the world's eyes, we're, we can be the evil ones right now. And so that's hard because you, I, for me, I kind of want to prove that it's not, but, um, but uh, Linda, thank you. That really was possible. And I want to read Sombra's comment. Um, and she says, and think of the Shema. Oh, here Israel. And it rolls into the, I don't know how to say that Sombra, but Vahat, Vahata, love. When you hear, listen, and enter into communication with the Father, it builds love. It's not just in the hearing, it's heeding instruction. We accept correction, which is the shemagin that builds love. Amen. Yeah. Shemagin. All right, I'm going to look through some of these other comments and just see if there's anything else, because there's quite a few. I don't want to miss anything. Oh, Marion, another good one. Um, she says, uh, or Marion says, Yeshua is perfect. He doesn't conform. He ate with and spoke with sinners, but we are all sinners. Yeah. So you're right. He never felt the need to conform yet. Somehow he had this amazing way 
of sharing the truth absolutely in love. All right, so let's let's move on a little bit and maybe just kind of talk about um, well we well there's two things I want to talk about. I'm trying to figure out wh which one is best. We may not have time for both, but quickly, and maybe you'll have more to say on this, Robin. But you talked earlier about the spirit of competition, mm -hmm. and another thing that really interested me in this partial was the competition between. Leah and Rachel. And I just learned, you wow. probably all already know this, but I didn't realize they were twins. Oh, like, I didn't know they were twins. Like Jacob and Esau. Do you guys know that? I read that in a midrash. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I read that they were also twins, which I thought was interesting. So there's something about looking at the way Jacob and Esau had this relationship, kind of this you know, competition and this tension, and then thinking of Leah and Rachel in a similar situation, but the competition over um, birthing children and how they ended up giving their maidservants as wives in the spirit of competition to try to birth more children. And this whole thing with competition, I, I just was kind of thinking about how I'm a super competitive person, how much I do that in my daily life where I feel like I have to, and actually I shouldn't say that because I'm not nearly as competitive as I used to be, but there was a time in my life where I was very competitive and I always wanted to try to get the upper hand in certain situations. But this whole idea of being competitive and we look at how much damage it caused caused both situations mm -hmm. to feel this need to compete. And do we feel the need to compete with family or spouses or people in the community or even in our jobs or, you know, mom to mom, like you want to just be the better mom or the better cook or whatever than this other mom. But I, I do think we, I just want to, I guess, just a quick blurb about cautioning people thinking that competition brings the Holy One glory. I don't personally think it does, but anyway, that's just a thought. Yeah. And maybe even just a check of what, what is the motivation behind my actions? You know, what, why, you know, when people confront me with like, I've, I've had to stop, you know, in several of the conversations, I've had to stop the dialogue, um, to, to, uh, to clarify, what is it that you think I'm saying? Because sometimes I, what I'm saying and what and the intentions that I'm saying it with, that, that's not the way it's being received. And so even, even getting you know, some clarification and, and, and then clarifying within yourself, what, what's my motivator here? Mm -hmm. you know, um, is it my motivator is that I'm affirmed because I was right and you know, kind of look at me or, or is, it, is it irrelevant of of me and is it more about building and growing the kingdom of the father to 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 bring more children in to his his kingdom yeah i think yeah. i think you're right there and i think um competition and pride can run very parallel to each other so i yeah. think what you said i i really understood and it and it resonates with me that um if we're doing something solely based on pride or because we need to be right then chances are we might not be doing it for the kingdom now, i understand there's righteous indignation and so sometimes we can do things and feel like you know i'm just i'm defending the father i'm defending the word and we can feel righteous in that but my experience has pretty much been competition is Kills relationships. It's deadly. It's yeah, deadly. It kills relationships. 100%. <clears throat> All right, Erica, I want you to be on standby um, because I want to talk about the speckled sheep and you had a post this morning that was really good. So if you're there, I might call on you in a minute and just see if you have any additional commentary because I really liked your post this morning on the Facebook page. Um, but let's kind of talk about uh, quickly. We only have a few minutes left, but let's talk about the speckled sheep and how Jacob went about what he did and how all of that surfaced. So 30,000 foot view, and I know all of you read it, but just to give you context of where we're heading, um, 
so the deal is after he has Rachel and, and, and Laban decides, listen, you, could you please stay and work? And, um, you know, I can pay you in wages. You've got my two girls, but because the Holy one is with you, I'm being blessed. And he convinces them to stay on and work. And the deal was again, kind of sly that he can keep all the spotted and blemished sheep um, and that they would kind of separate that way. But then Laban is deceitful and he takes all the spotted and blemished and he kind of moves them out of his herd and he gives them to his sons. And so Jacob starts with nothing. Right. And so Jacob, um, I want to share this because I actually saw this in a midrash, but it's also in Jasher too, that, uh, the Holy one came to him in a dream. And I was really thinking about this and I'd be curious in the chat if anyone has any thoughts on this, because I'd really like to learn more about it. But this whole idea that he had a medicinal way or a method to increase his flock um, because he had been wronged. And, 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 and what it says is that uh, the Holy One showed up and said, I know what, what Laban has done to you. And basically here's what you're going to do to build your, your wealth. And so Jacob did that. Um, Hey, Erica, are you there? Do you want to talk about, do you feel like you've got something to just kind of add to that? Hello. Hi. Um, I can't remember where I originally, I know it wasn't that long ago that I just read um, I mean, I knew about the speckled sheep and, and all of that before, but it was just recently that I saw it connected to the Messiah and taking the blemished, um, which I just thought was so beautiful. So I wish I could, if I find that reference sometime this week, uh, I know we're supposed to put away the, the portion. <laughs> on I Saturday never do. Night. It's, it's too hard. hard. I know it's ours. Because after Saturday these calls, night. I always want to go study more. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But um but uh, Petra was asking about the sticks. And one of the things when I was um, thinking about that, I looked something up and found, um, uh, I don't know if it was from a Christian or Hebrew perspective, but they say that it was probably um, like a cultural superstition thing oh, about the sticks okay. and things like that. So um, I, that was just from one source. So that, that would, may have been something um, that was just, um, you know, maybe common to that area to think that, um, you know, they could do this and that's what caused it. But I think he makes reference to later. And I, if someone can pull that out of their mind, where basically it, it's the father who says that he has done it for him. Mm -hmm. Does that sound familiar? I like, yes. I can't pull it out, but I like, I know I yeah. just read it last night. So I don't know which, which verse, but um, so even though he was trying these things, maybe he was just trying it because he had seen it done, you know, right there with Laban, you know, Laban, we know Laban, uh, he wasn't, you know, necessarily a follower of, um, the, the creator. So he probably used anything that he thought would benefit him the most. So if he thought witchcraft or superstitions were going to do it, he may have gone to, but that's the only perspective that I saw on it was that one. Okay. I heard, I heard very similar that, um, it was a picture, um, a, a prophetic picture of Jacob, like, um, in the, in the place of Messiah. And then you've got the pure, uh, sheep that maybe represent, I'm not sure if it was like the the Jewish people in general, that was kind of my interpretation, although I can't recall if they said that, but the whole idea of what I read was that these spotted and speckled that were going to multiply were the idea of the mixed multitude, the Gentiles being grafted in, and that Messiah coming was going to be the one who was able to cause that to happen. So by Messiah's coming, he was going to shepherd the, um, the Gentile people, the mixed multitude. And that was why that story was um, important in scripture to, to demonstrate what Jesus was going to do, what Messiah was going to do when he came in terms of the Jewish population and that, that, that there was hope in there. So I don't know, does anyone else have any thoughts on the spot and speckled? Um, we've got just a few minutes left, but you, I'm, I wanna call on Sambra. 
I know she's there. She, I'm sure she's prepping right now, probably making like 50 million different things in her kitchen, but I want to see your new glasses anyway, because they're so cool. <laughs> I love your new glasses. Thank you. I, our Shabbat tonight, I have invited about 30 people to come to Shabbat dinner tonight. Woo! It's, yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't remember what the question was, but I just wanted to say, we have, um, our Saturday is busy with the way we like to run our Saturday service, service, but it's all online. And so we're really missing people fellowship. So we decided that the way to get people fellowship was not to change our Saturday, but was to change our Friday night. So we're looking at inviting people and we're just going to start with inviting and having a little community in our home, but maybe eventually we'll have to rent a little spot and have a Friday evening event. Are you kind of, out, are you kind of out in the middle of nowhere or do you have a lot of people mm -hmm. around you and are the people you inviting tonight? Are they people walking in Torah or not? They are people loosely walking in Torah. Um, there is two families here in my town who um, are, are walking in Torah, um, but it's still, well, one family is 100% in Torah. The other family is sort of like got half foot in Christianity and half foot in Torah. Sorry, my husband is talking to Seth. She's going to yell and tell him to be uh -huh. quiet. <laughs> hey, quiet down. They called me out on the portion. Yeah, I just, <laughs> um, my husband's trying to get my kids to keep working. Um, anyhow, um, there is a, a single man who's been here to Shabbat dinner that I met and his brother and baby that are coming and they don't have fellowship. Um, there is another family from the city who have never kept Sabbath before. They're still in Christianity, but they're interested to learn. There's another family where for the last two years, the mom has been trying really hard to walk in Torah. Dad, dad can kind of see that Torah is right. And the kids are, well, the kids are kind of half in, half out. So anyhow, it's, it's a mixed multitude, right? And, but the so point you're having is a all, mixed multitude at your house tonight. I'm having a mixed multitude at my house. And, and the point is they're all uncommunitied. Like they don't go to church. They don't have fellowship and, you know, it gets pretty lonely. Yeah. So I figure, Hey, let's all get together, even though we're all kind of different and we'll just find a common point and work from there. And if all the common point is we all need to be fed then hallelujah, we all just need to be fed. <laughs> um, well, we all want to go. We were, were wondering why our invitations didn't get, you know, sent. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking um, there's about 20 people on this this uh, this chat, and um, I, I'm RSVPing now. Is that am I late? <laughs> well, Sombra knows I want to come live with her. I keep saying that. Like oh, one wow. of these days, I'm just going to show show up. And is it Saskatchewan? Well, my question is, can you get over the border? No, but probably we not. There, yeah, we probably shouldn't have that conversation. But anyhow, um, so what was your question? What did you ask? Me well, my question was just, um, and I'm sorry that I pulled you away from all your Shabbat, but we were talking about the speckled sheep and um, Jacob sort of being the picture of Yeshua and the speckled sheep being the Gentile population and how it was going to grow and multiply because of his shepherdship and how the sheep that Laban kind of took and separated that were unspotted maybe represented the Jewish population, but just thinking that there's probably a little more to that story. So I'd asked Erica for insight. And I'm just curious if you had any quick thoughts on, on, on the speckled sheep. Okay, so, le so let me just go over here and blow your mind for a sec. Oh, okay. <laughs> I love when people blow my mind and I'm just okay. going to tell you, we have about four minutes left. So, oh, oh well, I probably can't do it in four minutes, but anyhow, if you consider who, who did Jesus say he was coming back for? He said he was coming back to the lost sheep, lost tribes of Israel, right? Yep. Or the lost sheep of Israel, the lost sheep. Yep. Okay. So if you look at history and you look at, um, when the Hebrews before the Hebrews even went into the promised land, the Hebrews were in Egypt. And again, talking about those twins, there was Perez and Zerah. Zerah apparently left like long before, like when the Hittites arrived in Egypt, Zerah left. And Zerah went 
north and they ended up um, settling in what's called what we now call Athens. Then there's other people groups that come out of that. One of those people groups is called the, um, the Dardan or Dardanelle, the Dardanelles. So if you look at that little strip of water that goes through between, is it the Black Sea? Anyhow, it's where Constantinople is. That area is called the Dardanelles. Those are Hebrew peoples. If you look at when the tribes of Israel got taken out of Israel and taken to what we now call northern Iran, you know, during the during the during the Assyrian exile, mm -hmm. those people groups that never came back to the promised land, they ended up becoming the Parthians, and the Parthians ended up going north through um, the Caucasus Mountains and up into northern, like north of the Black Sea, north of the Caspian Sea. So some of them became the, the Khazars and some of them became what we call the Scythians. And from the Scythians, they became the Celts. Um, and the Celts, as we know, went all the way from the bottom of um, Spain, all the way up through France, they ended up, there was a different group and ended up becoming called Gauls, but they ended up all the way over into Ireland and Scotland and England. Um, the word, the word British comes from a guy named Brutus, who was a Hebrew, uh, Troy, Trojans, all of those peoples were Hebrews. It's an absolutely fascinating study. So when you think about where does Paul go, Paul goes to Troy, he goes to all those areas, Turkey, and like Greece, and all those areas in there, in that, what's it called, the Aegean Sea, mm -hmm. those people, we call those people Gentiles, but all those people groups came from the Hebrews. Wow. Isn't that fascinating? Mm -hmm. I never would have even thought that. Yeah. It's absolutely fascinating so if you follow the if you follow it etymologically you can follow the names as the names change and if you follow it um with the emblems that you know like the the seals like uh Peretz was born Peretz and Zara were born and one of them stuck his hand out first and he gets the he gets the red string put around him well that red string that red hand if you look in Ireland Ireland has like Northern Ireland has the red hand as its symbol and um, things like the cross, the cross that goes like this. And then the cross that goes like this in the British flag, that's the olive and the top. Yeah. Um, She's so full of information, isn't she? Oh my goodness. And sadly, I have to cut you off because we're at one thirty. but that is fascinating. I think That's you should do a course school, in yeah. the cafe on that. That's what I think we should do a course in the cafe on that. And a course about Shabbat prayers. I mean, I could load you up with a ton of courses to do in the cafe. I know, but my other ministry is loading, overloading me right now. With other stuff. Millie says, yes, Millie's on board. She's rooting for that. Oh, uh, anyway, yeah. thank you, Sombra. You're always Talk so about full of information. And Talk about specked and speckled, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if we are not the spotted and speckled sheep, Good grief. We are we the spotted and speckled. These, we come from all these different people groups. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I'll be quiet. <laughs> Thank you. That was really like here. That was kind of like, so I feel like we had a really good portion, but that was kind of like the grand finale, like something y'all yeah. just didn't expect. It was just this great explosion of information. So anyway, we do have to wrap up our time here. We are going to do just a quick 30 minute after party because I'm technically still working today. But for those of you who on Facebook who would like to um, join us, come on over. And if people want to stay for a half hour and just kind of chat casually, join us on the 30 minute after party. We would love to have you. So on that, I'm going to wish you all a fabulous Shabbat. We love you so much. And thank you for being here today. And I'm going to stop recording.